My lords, the BBC this morning. A teenager has been stabbed to death in West London. Knife crime is increasing at an alarming rate, having reached its highest rate in eight years in 2017-18. Every death is a tragedy, and too many of our young people are losing their lives. But the parents, friends and relatives of those killed do not, don't just want our sympathy, they want us to actually do something about it. I am proposing a five-point public health approach to knife crime, only one of which involves more resources for the police, because this should primarily be about addressing the causes of knife crime, not the symptoms. The picture of knife crime is complex. First, there are those who rely on violence. Drug dealing, because it's an illegal activity, cannot be legally regulated. It can be fatal in a direct way because there is little or no quality control, no information about purity or potency, no restrictions on who can buy drugs or in what quantity. But it is unregulated in another way. Deals are enforced and competition is challenged using violence because there is no legal means of doing so. Whether to ensure your stash of illegal drugs is not stolen, to ensure that the buyer pays or to defend your turf knives are used to regulate. And this trade is spilling out from our big cities into the countryside and seaside towns through county lines. Vulnerable young people are being exploited, being sent to live in appalling conditions to sell drugs hundreds of miles from home under the threat of being stabbed by their own and rival gang members. But many in the black community feel that the drugs element of knife crime is overplayed, even racist. All the drug dealers I have met have been white. The use of knives amongst criminal gangs is as likely to be about so-called respect. Respect for senior members of the gang who stab junior members who step out of line, and respect for a gang's territory and standing by threatening or stabbing members of rival gangs. Not just me saying this, my lords, but the College of Policing evidence-based report on knife crime. Connected to gang rivalry are the violent lyrics of drill music and violent YouTube videos. Some say they are legitimate artistic expressions of lived experience, reflecting the violent environment in which they live. Others say they encourage, incite and drive violence as the competition to be the gang with the greatest number of hits or views on the internet rise in proportion to how shocking the violence is that is contained within them. At the same time as the criminal, gang, sorry, the criminal gang culture has grown, the visible presence of authority on the streets has diminished. Community police officers and, more importantly, police community support officer numbers have been decimated. There's been a 19 per cent real terms reduction in total funding from central and local uh, government to police and crime commissioners 2010-11 compared to 2018-19. Central government funding for commissioners has fallen 30% in real terms since 2010-11. Since the peak in the, uh, at the 31st of March 2009, police officer numbers have fallen by 21,365 officers, over 14% as at the 31st of March 2018. The number of police community support officers, the bridge between the police and communities, has fallen by 7,127, a reduction of over 42%. My Lords, I am a member of the Knife Crime All-Party Parliamentary Group, ably led by Sarah Jones MP, and we've heard from young people involved in knife crime about the impact of these cuts and what, the impact that it's had on them. One told us that she used to feel safe when she saw safer neighbourhood teams who worked out of her local police station. The safer neighbourhood teams, one sergeant, two constables and three PCSOs in every ward in London now consist of two officers per ward, provided they are not on their day off, on holiday, off sick, on maternity or paternity leave. There is no backfilling. That same young woman described her term in Holloway Prison as the best time of her life. Detention is no deterrent and knife crime prevention orders work against a public health approach, potentially criminalising more and more young people. 
The second group of knife carriers are those young people who believe they need to carry a knife to protect themselves from those who rely on violence because they see no visible uniformed presence on their streets. Even if the police were there, many believe they are not there to protect them. Many in the black community still feel that they are over-policed and under-protected, that the police are only there to stop and search them or arrest them, even when they are innocent. Blanket Section 60 operations simply add to that perception. Community policing is not just a visible deterrent to criminals and a reassurance to victims. It enables community intelligence to more accurately target stop and search <coughs> on those who the community know are the knife carriers. Policing carried out with the community, not done to a community. Some noble lords, including the minister, may say that they do not recognise the scenario that I'm describing, and it's easy to ignore the reality when the violence is largely contained within these communities, rarely spilling out to disturb, to, to disturb the likes of you or me. But I've talked to young people who live in these areas, I have worked in these areas, and I still live in one of these areas, and I recognise what young people are describing. So what makes young people join gangs? At an individual level, many of these young people are suffering from adverse childhood experiences. Domestic violence, abandonment through divorce or separation, a parent with mental health condition, being the victim of physical or sexual abuse or neglect, either physical or emotional, where a member of the household is in prison, or growing up in a household where adults are experiencing alcohol or drug misuse problems. Many have grown up in a situation where violence is seen as the normal way to resolve problems, where bullying and misogyny are normalised, where involving outside help is alien. When members of the APPG visited the only young offender institution in Scotland, without exception, the inmates have experienced multiple ACEs. Young offenders are invested in, in Scotland. They are counselled about their adverse experiences. A resident police officer explains that the police are there as much to protect them as to lock them up. A woman's refuge worker explains what normal families and healthy relationships look like. Some of this emotional neglect, not being made to feel loved, wanted and belonging, is not the fault of hard-working parents, some of whom must do multiple jobs, working 16 hours a day, six or seven days a week, to pay the rent and put food on the table. They simply don't have the time or the energy to do what they want to do for their children, to do what their children need and want from their parents. Many children do not belong to a school community either. Whether it is a rigid traditional education that fails to engage all pupils, or whether ACEs result in disruptive behaviour, many find themselves officially excluded from school or informally off-rolled. School performance targets result in schools taking the easy option of jettisoning so-called difficult pupils. On the APPG's visit to Scotland to, to Scotland, to Glasgow, the number of pupils excluded from school in the city was less than the fingers on one hand. In the London borough of Croydon, more than 1,500 pupils have been excluded from school in recent years, and that's just one London borough. I want to suggest five priorities for government action. First, we need to tackle in-work poverty by mandating the real living wage and providing support to parents the, pe the support that they need in order to provide for their children through such things as children's centres and Sure Start. Councils have suffered a 77% decrease in government funding between 2015-16 and 2019-20. Second, we need to provide self and healthy alternatives to criminal gangs by properly funding youth services, outreach workers, and the kind of modern youth clubs that really engage young people. Charities and sports clubs need to have long-term core funding, which local authorities used to provide, and churches, mosques, synagogues, gurdwaras, temples and others that provide somewhere safe for young people to go should be acknowledged and, uh, and they need to be supported and encouraged. 
Third, we need to heal the damage caused by adverse childhood experiences. Investing in children's mental health and intervening in teachable moments like Red Thread's work in emergency departments with the victims of knife crime. Fourth, we need to provide truly inclusive education where no pupil is left behind. Compulsory sex and relationship education for all pupils without exception needs to include teaching the violent, exploitative realities of criminal gang membership, like the excellent work done by the charity of which I am patron, GAV. And finally, we need to create an environment where communities and the police can unite against knife crime by restoring community policing. My Lords, the situation is far more complex than I have been able to outline in the time available. I hope Noble Lords would add, will add to my necessary limited opening to this important debate. But my Lords, I must emphasise that this is not a Liberal Democrat plan. This is the result of me being a member of the all-party parliamentary group on knife crime under the excellent le uh, leadership uh, of Sarah Jones MP. And if uh, Noble Lords have had the chance to look at the Bernardo's briefing that Noble Lords will have been sent in relation to this, they will recognise a lot of what I have said in my opening. And as I have just previously mentioned, the briefing, the evidence-based briefing of the College of Policing, which talks about heavy-handed stop and search resulting in, in it being less likely for communities to come forward with the vital intelligence that police forces need. How, even though um, it is not a direct pro uh, proportionate uh, be uh, between crime reduction and the number of police officers, once you get a, below a particular level of policing, criminals feel that they uh, can act with impunity and victims of crime feel that, that they have no choice but to defend themselves. My Lords, one of the most disheartening responses this morning on Twitter to the outline plan which I have just outlined to you was, and who is going to pay for this? My Lords, the people who are paying for this now are the victims who are dying on our streets. Yeah, 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 yeah and the families and the relatives of those who are dying. If we don't do something about this, those families, those young people will continue to pay for our inaction. Yeah. Yeah. My Lords, I want to commend the noble Lord, uh, Lord Paddock, for seeking the debate on this very timely subject and for his wide-ranging and comprehensive way he introduced it. I also commend them for the piece he wrote on this subject for the latest issue of the House magazine. In this article, which I am sure that many noble lords will have read, Lord Paddock describes the complexity of the knife crime phenomenon and discusses both its underlying causes and its potential solutions. The solutions he mentions in this article, and which he's just mentioned in his speech, are not the kinds of things which one would normally associate with someone who spent most of his professional life as a police officer on the streets of London. But, my lords, they are the kinds of things which are required to solve complex social problems like violent youth crime, which results from an amalgam of, among other things, poverty, inequality, poor schooling, unemployment, social alienation and racial prejudice. There are no quick fixes in this world, my lords, and I commend the noble Lord, Lord Paddock, for making this abundantly clear. I also commend the government for taking a similarly broad and longer-term approach to this problem. As my noble friend Baroness Barron said in an answer to an oral question about youth violence last Thursday morning, and I quote, the government are taking steps to address all aspects of youth violence from prevention to enforcement. Diverting young people away from crime is at the heart of our approach which is why we are investing more than $220 million in early intervention schemes to steer children and young people away from serious violence. How refreshing to hear a minister discuss a complex social problem without either minimizing its significance or promising to deal with it almost instantaneously without giving any indication about how this is to be achieved. Having said this, I do not believe that we are condemned to live with blood-stained streets for decades until these longer-term solutions uh, do their work. 
Although tackling the underlying causes of social violence will take time and money, I believe on the basis of my own experience of working both in New York and Philadelphia police departments from 96 to 2004, that the level of violent crime on our streets can be significantly reduced in the short term by proactive policing based on good intelligence, adequate resources, well-developed strategy, and effective tactics and leadership. But we don't have to look overseas for examples of successful policing operations. The recent success of our own Metropolitan Police in tackling moped crime is an excellent example of how effective policing can eliminate within weeks problems which have reduced whole communities to abject fear of public spaces. That's why I believe, my lords, that what's required to tackle our present knife crisis is a two-pronged approach. A longer-term strategy focused on underlying social problems of the kind which the noble Lord, Lord Paddock, has mentioned, as well as short-term tactical action based on high-quality, proactive, and innovative local policing using good information and good technology. I say local policing because I believe that violent crime on our streets is most effectively tackled by local police forces acting with the support of their local communities. There are two main reasons for this. First, street crime is basically a local problem. Although it's now widespread, it doesn't affect every city or town to the same extent. Even within a single county, there are major differences between one part and another. As Matthew Ellis, the PCC of Staffordshire, said in a press release only yesterday, announcing new measures against life, uh, knife crime, although some places in Staffordshire have an issue with knife crime, most places in the county do not. Second, effective policing depends critically on community cooperation. Even American police chiefs, whose approach to policing is often derided in this country as overly aggressive, recognize that community support is the foundation of community safety. Bill Bratton, for example, who dramatically reduced crime as chief of police in both New York and Los Angeles, writing about knife crime in London in a national UK newspaper, said that it's not a matter of simply putting more cops on the streets, although we called for more cops on the streets. It's a question of what they're doing on the street. And I quote, you don't want them just being seen enforcing all the rules and regulations. You want them interacting with the community. They need to be developing a relationship with the community that allows an intimacy of understanding. It's only when such an understanding with the community has been established that police operations like stop and search can be effective. Without this understanding and rapport, police officers carrying out this basic policing operation are often seen as an occupying army. That's why I urge the government to adopt this two-pronged approach to knife crime, a combination of national policies, programs, resources, and leadership aimed at tackling the underlying complex social issues which lie at the heart of the problem, and local policies, programs, resources, and leadership aimed at tackling the immediate problems on our streets. The good news, my lords, is that our local police and crime commissioners and their forces are more than able to rise to this challenge, and not only in terms of tactical policing <laughs> operations, but also in terms of imaginative social problems involving local schools and local doctors. I wish I had time to tell you all about, but tell you about some of these programs such as those developed in Norfolk by PCC Lauren Green, in Bedfordshire by PCC Catherine Holloway, and Staffordshire by PCC Matthew Ellis. My Lords, I believe that night crime is best tackled by our national and local institutions working together. I feel very strongly about this because I fear that a new Prime Minister, whoever he may be, will wish to demonstrate the smack of firm government by taking personal control of the fight against knife crime and directing it from number 10 what I call the Tony Blair approach to fighting crime. I don't for a moment oppose all interest in this issue from the center. Indeed, more funding from Whitehall is always welcome and useful, provided, of course, it's distributed to those programs and forces which have most need of it. <laughs> what I fear is operational direction from Whitehall. This is almost always counterproductive and is aimed primarily at attracting national headlines rather than solving local problems. My Lords, our present arrangements for ensuring local community safety are more than fit for the purpose of tackling the problems of night crime effectively and sensitively. There's no need to develop new arrangements for this job. 
let's simply provide those who are doing the job with the support they need to do it. Yeah, yeah. My Lord, I am uh, pleased to follow Lord Westerman, and I would be happy to be able to just adopt his speech. Uh, he clearly has a significant knowledge of policing, but I, I, the part of his speech that I really want to own uh, with him is his uh, commendation to the noble Lord, Lord Paddock, for securing this debate and for the way in which he has introduced it. Um, clearly, I follow two speakers who have had significant knowledge of policing, and I do not intend to try and compete with that, and I think that you know, we're, we're going to find ourselves in a debate here in which there's going to be violence, but it's going to be violent agreement with each other. Um, so, so, however, and I feel qualified to contribute to this debate because before I was elected to Parliament, I spent about 25 years practicing law in the west of Scotland. So that 25 years was practicing law in the west of Scotland, in which I was in courts at every level, and every single day was confronted by the tip of the iceberg of the violence that was in the society that I was a member of, all across Scotland. The levels of violence were horrific, and the repetition of that violence, I mean, I, in only 25 years, can tell you in the court I most practiced in, I saw, I saw the same names coming up generation after generation behaving in exactly the same way and producing the same damage to their own family and to others. And there was a general sense of resignation that that was just the norm. The combination of these things, nobody was going to ever be able to shift it. Uh, and when I became the Member of Parliament for Kilmarnock and Loudoun, for a period that did not change. But then a police officer called Carnahan came on the scene. And he essentially was appointed to the position that most people would, I think, who don't know about policing, recognise as he was the Taggart of Scotland. He was in charge of Strathclyde's police murder squad. And, and I met him, and he transformed the way in which, even after a quarter of a century of knowledge of this, I looked at the issue of violence. It was a remarkable um, event for me when I met him and Karen McCluskey, who uh, worked with him and who started what is now referred to as the Violence Reduction Unit, but had another more sophisticated name, but that doesn't really matter. And he told me this really interesting anecdote. He said that the clear up rate for uh, the police, Strathclyde Police, of homicides was extraordinarily high. It was well into the 90 per cent, and they were in great demand across the world as, they were, as, they, as people wanted to know how they could clear up these crimes so, good, so well. because. Many other places have terrible uh, challenges in that. And he told me, I can't remember exactly where he was about to mount the podium, but he told me as he was about to mount the podium, he had a kind of road to Damascus moment. He said, Why should I be so proud of clearing up murders? I should really be preventing them from happening. And instinctively, from his knowledge, he had. He had some sense of why this violence was happening, and he set about with the I think, I think it would be the, the Chief Constable at the time of Strathclyde was a man called Ray, with the permission and the instruction of the Chief Constable to concentrate on this. And within five years of setting up the unit that he set up and implementing what has become known as a public health approach to this, he had helped, he and others, had half the level of violence in the community that they served as police officers. This is a stunning statistic. And in preparation for this debate, I came across a, a an interview that he gave recently, because he has been very busy with visitors from London um, and from the South, uh, as he explains to people, including the Mayor of London and, uh, and, and, and others, um, how he did this. So he was interviewed at length, and this interview, I commend to everybody, is published in uh, Inside Politics on the 10th of May 2018. Um, I, I, as part of the online version, I think, of the Holyrood magazine. So this is an extensive uh, interview in which he, in the current context, explains this. And I, I have no intention, because I don't have the time to do this in any event, but there is a sentence in here which is compelling. He said, when people came, first of all, he thought that they were looking for some sort of magic bullet, and there was none. You know, this was 
if we were to reduce violence, it was a complicated approach that would have to be that would have to be taken to it. And, and they were shocked by the fact that the level of violence still in Scotland is appalling, but that it had been half in a relatively short period of time was the point that he was making. There was still much more work to be done. And in no sense is this man complacent about this. But I, I quote one sentence to you from this, which I think is crucially important and is the lesson that I, if, if we will take this away, it's not nearly a sophisticated approach to it, but it's a very strong truth. He said, I said to, I quote, I said to them, you need to get past the crime figures. Stop talking about knife crime and talk about violence and try to understand the patterns. And then he goes on in this, and you can read it for yourself, he goes on in this as to what he means by that. And he pushes back against those people who suggest that this phraseology diverts attention away from victims and from the consequences of crime, because it doesn't. He said, I would never give up on all of these issues, all of the aspects of this which the Noble Lord Parrick and Lord Wasserman have identified that are important to individual communities and to their safety. But the most important thing is to learn from that. And, and I just say to you from having grown up in this environment, that was done in the most difficult environment I can imagine to try and shift the pattern of violence. And if it can work there, despite the complexities that we will hear about in this debate, it can work elsewhere. The second point I want to make is, 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 more, is more a point for the House, in some, in some senses, than it is for this debate. And that is that I have been impressed immensely by the quality of the briefings that I have received. I received seven in total, one from Bernardo, as it has been referred to. And, and, and it, <laughs> a few minutes past ten last night, my mobile phone alerted me to um, a, 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 an email, and, and, and I got, for the first time in my uh, in my possession, a copy of the College of Policing Knife Crime Evidence Briefing. I'm kind of giving them a subliminal message that maybe 10 past 11 the night before the debate is a bit late, and I haven't yet read it, but I've looked through it. But it just it occurred to me as I was doing this and thinking about this, I can't do justice to any of these briefings I've received, but they're all full of great stuff. So it just occurs to me that I mean, we're searching constantly in Parliament to find a way to be relevant and to bring people in, into Why don't we, in relation to every single debate, open a portal for those who wish to brief and engage in the debate? It would have to be moderated, post their briefings. And then in real time, they can be considered by people who go back to this, relating to it. It would stop any of us having to read them in. It would stop any of us having to give them name checks. They would all be part of our deliberations. And then, you know, in, in this environment we're in, that, that's a, a very, it would be a very good thing to do. Um, I just have one question. I've run out of time, and I'm sorry, I apologise, but I, I want to ask this question, because this is about accountability by the government. The go I, I've been trying to follow what the government are actually doing in terms of st strategy and planning in relation to violence. There's been a lot of activity, there's been a lot of renaming of committees, but there, is, there was a written statement after the Prime Minister's summit on this. The last paragraph of that written statement says that the deliverables of the, of, of, of the summit represent an increased programme of work across, uh, across government. It promises to do some things which I hope the Noble Lady the Minister will do in her summing up. It promises to keep the Parliament updated, it promises a plan of action, and it promises some detail as to how the government is going to go forward. So we know the strategy. I think we need to hear what the plan of action is. My Lords, I welcome this debate, and I declare an interest as a member of the All Party Parliamentary Group on knife crimes. My Lords, the incidents, and to a lesser extent, the nature of crime may vary from place to place and from generation to generation. But crime is something with which all communities have to come to terms in their own way and devise appropriate strategies. Over the years, you have learned much about the underlying causes of crime and a good, of, a good deal of research into the effectiveness of various responses. My Lord's overall, most research has tended to refute rather than confirm about hypotheses about the causes of crime and the effectiveness of punishment and treatments. 
In essence, public and political mood is conditioned by hunch, gut feeling, and media hype than by outcomes of detailed research. My Lord's knife crime has achieved much publicity in recent times. There is a widespread public perception that our society is becoming increasingly lawless. This is supplemented by statistics of offenses recorded by the police. The austerity and the subsequent cuts that followed in public services since 2010 has contributed toward this phenomena, a reality we fail to appreciate. Not all crimes are reported. Public expectations for police's ability to solve crimes are far, far greater than the service's ability to deliver this. this my Lord, let's just look at the, just let, look at the crime, uh, knife crimes. The grim statistics of rising knife crime are well known and well publicized, as have the tragic consequences of knife crime for victims and their families. Last year, the number of recorded offenses involving knives was at the highest level since comparable data became available. Malas, what can be done to stem and reverse this alarming trend? From any approach to tackling knife crime to be effective, we must stand back and look at the reasons why young people decide to carry knives. One research study summed up the reason for, in the phrase, fear of fashion. Fear because many knife crime offenders say that they carry knives for their own protection. They have the misguided belief that it will make them safer as they can use their knives to defend themselves if they're attacked. In fact, the truth is the opposite. All the evidence show that offenders who carry knives are more likely to end up in a violent confrontation yeah. in which they are stabbed with a weapon, either someone else's knife or their own, as well as being more likely to end up carrying the tragedy of injury or death to someone else. My Lord's fashion refers to the fact that many impressionable young people carry knives because they see it as part of a mature self-image. Drug misuse and dealing also is an important part of this particular picture. It's unrealistic to think that we can ultimately solve the problem by punitive approaches to this particular issue. In recent years, the proportion of knife crime offenders receiving custodial sentences has sharply increased because partly because the Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015 introduced minimum sentences of four months for juveniles and six months for those 18 plus who are sentenced for carrying a knife for a second time. However, this has not stopped knife crime from rising, nor have increased in, in the stop and search policies that we've adopted. Research study after research study have found little correlation between the use of stop and search and the rate of knife crime or violence generally. My Lord, and the, and, and the resentment with the heavy-handed and racially disproportionate, disproportionate use of stop and search produces in young people all too often drives them into the arms of gangs rather than the opposite. <laughs> so we need to look at more constructive solutions to the problem. Custodial sentences are inevitable for offenses which have caused death or serious injuries to victims. But I can see little point in passing short custodial sentences on many of the young people who have been apprehended or carrying a knife. Short custodial sentences are commonly agreed to be the most pointless mm. and ineffective sentences which courts can impose. Mm. They are much higher reoffending rates than in any other form of sentences. Their contain, con containment effect is very short-lived. They are not long enough for any sustained attempt at rehabilitation in custody, as they do not provide enough time for an offending behavior program, a drug treatment program, or a vocational training program. My, Lord, my lords, however, they are long enough for offenders who have stable accommodation to lose it, for those who have jobs to lose them, and for those involved in education or training courses to lose the chance of completing them. Yeah. This means that on release, these offenders are more likely to be homeless, jobless, and not involved in training or education, all things which increase rather than reduce the likelihood of offending. Moreover, young offenders can all too often react the wrong way to a short spell in custody by deciding that they have to live up to a hard image in front of their peers. For all this reason, short custodial sentences 
can often do more harm than good. A demanding community centre is much more likely to provide the opportunity for intensive work to tackle the attitudes which lead offenders to carry knives. Yet the community sentences has been falling. The approaches which are the most likely to change young people's attitudes to carrying knives are programs of intervention which show young people the real consequence of this misguided way of thinking. Many of the most effective interventions are those which involve former offenders who have now matured and see for themselves the awful negative consequences of carrying weapons. My lords, these ex-offenders can often act as credible and positive role models for young people, particularly if these interventions are combined with practical help with education and training, which can equip young people to, the, to lead a more constructive lifestyle. Any available funding to tackle, tackle knife crimes would be far better spent on funding more intervention of this kind than any other approach to this particular problem. And this approach would be more likely than any other to reduce the number of families whose lives are blighted by the appalling consequence of young people's willingness to get in eyes. Yeah. 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 My Lords, I too am grateful to the noble Lord Lord Panic for obtaining this uh, debate, but also for his excellent analysis of some of the causes and indeed the work that's been done on how we might address them, which is a holistic approach. I'm also delighted that we have a number of people who are experts in policing who are going to who are speaking in this uh, uh, debate. Uh, I come at this with very little knowledge of that, but I uh, do have knowledge uh, through the 136 schools in my diocese. I've been in two of them already this week, and indeed in many of the urban areas across Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire who are uh, seeking to bring together groups of young people to reflect on how this can be uh, addressed. Uh, the debate we're in is looking at the impact of government policies on serious youth violence. And as the causes are many and varied, we do need to look at a wide range of different issues. We're all aware that access to lethal weapons has escalated and intensified conflict. Demonstrably, when the year to March 2018 represented the highest number of knife uh, homicides in England and Wales since 1946, it's all too clear to us that uh, it's too easy to obtain weapons, notwithstanding the Offensive Weapons Act 2019. And indeed, with uh, uh, previous problems, for example, with acid attacks, we're aware that simply removing one way of attacking other people doesn't uh, necessarily immediately solve a problem. So I'm delighted that government action in reducing weapon accessibility has had some success with Operation Scepter taking some 10,000 knives off the streets, yet piecemeal approaches will never be enough. Uh, other speakers have already ra uh, raised the question about the way that we approach uh, the stop and search policies, and we do need to hear, and I hope the Minister will be able to comment on, uh, the latest evidence about how this uh, policy is being implemented and where it is actually achieving the aims that we want it to. Assessing government policy's impact requires an appreciation of the complex and interlinked factors that drive young people into violence. As Centre Point has said, there are many factors driving youth violence, whether it's poverty, exclusion, disadvantage or other situations. It is nevertheless significant that 21% of young people convicted of possessing a knife were people who'd been excluded from school. And lack of children's support generally, whether due to the cut of 62% in council early year service spending since 2010, or the loss of more than 1,000 sure start centres, or the rise in school exclusions are all contributing factors in serious youth violence. If we do not provide children with support in their lives, whether in their communities or at schools, we risk alienating them from participation in wider society. I therefore welcome the Home Office working with Ofsted and the Department for Education in focusing on the risks surrounding crime and exclusions. All children deserve uh, education, opportunities and support, as they all have the potential to contribute to the good of society. If young people are going to play a full part, 
it certainly means they must have access to employment. And that's why we must consider the impact of government policies on tackling unemployment. I'm sure, like many other members of this House, I'm shocked that young people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds are almost twice as likely to be unemployed than their white counterparts. I wonder if the Minister could explain to the House what impact government policy is having in addressing this specific issue. Communities ha have a significant influence on the people in them. I note the uh, views of the Children's Society who produced one of these briefing papers who say children carrying weapons should be seen as a child protection issue which needs a safeguarding response. A whole system approach must include all government departments. Young people thrive best when their lives are given validity through positive community affirmation. Yet when young people feel they've fallen short of being worthy of affirmation, the power of society as a redemptive force is crucial. With a presence in every community, we in the churches and from these benches want to play our part in combating serious youth violence. In just a couple of weeks' time, the General Synod of the Church of England will be having a debate on this subject, during which the Reverend Canon uh, Dr. Mary, uh, uh, Rosemary Mallet, a prominent campaigner, indeed a parish priest in an area that's seen a great deal of serious youth violence, will be calling on parishes to open doors uh, of our churches for after-school hours to make safe places. This type of community-led action is about providing safe spaces for the young who sometimes can view the church or indeed other religious premises as a neutral group. Perhaps this is why the capital city's busiest knife amnesty bin is in the church in St John's Hoxton. And we want to explore how we too can play our part to help with this. We're not blind to violence, we see its uh, impact on our streets, in our parishes, in many urban areas. It's been widely reported in the press in the last week that some churches in my own diocese in the centre of Luton, inspired by the words of the prophet Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into ploughshares and their spears into pruning hooks, have uh, uh, been reclaiming uh, 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 knives that have been uh, uh, delivered through a knife amnesty and have made a striking uh, uh, sculpture of a phoenix rising from the ashes. Just like the phoenix, communities can rise together. My lords, this is much bigger than just unemployment, much bigger than just policing. We need to try and engage everybody we possibly can at grassroots for a much wider debate and much wider society ownership if we're going to address this problem, which is causing devastation to so many individuals and families across our nation. My Lords, I'm delighted to be able to add my congratulations to the noble Lord Lord Paddock for introducing this uh, debate and for the manner in which he introduced it. But I'd like to pick up uh, many of the points made by uh, the Right Reverend Prelate in, in a very thoughtful and interesting speech a few moments ago. My Lords, I've been reflecting very much over this last week on the years that I have been in Parliament, because last year, uh, last week, I'm sorry, marked the 49th uh, anniversary of my election in June 1970. And in thinking about this debate, I've been reflecting on some of the great changes that have taken place in our society during that time. And there are three in particular that stand out. I'm not making value judgments, I'm merely stating facts. The family has changed very much in that period. And what was then the norm is no longer the norm. The drug culture, which has grown up over the last years and to which the noble Lord Paddock referred in his opening remarks, is something that was unknown in 1970. And another enormous change is, of course, the advent and the prevalence of social media. Because without social media, the county lines to which he referred could hardly exist. 
and we are having to cope with a very different sort of society than existed when I was first elected to Parliament. And of course it's very right that we should talk, as we have today, of proactive policing and community policing. But although he did not use the exact words, the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, was in effect saying to us, and I believe very strongly in this, that prevention is better than cure. And what we have to do is to try and develop a culture where the use of a knife in violence becomes something that is just not contemplated. It'll take time. But I believe it has to begin in the home and it has to begin in the school. And I have been very critical many times in your Lordship's house about the deficiencies in careers advice in schools and in citizenship education. I do believe, and I've mentioned this before, that every young person leaving school in our country should have had to do some community service during his or her last year in school. And whether that is taking meals to the elderly, looking after the young or whatever, does not particularly matter. But community service, putting something in to the community, should be, frankly, obligatory. And I would like to see every young person leaving school going through a citizenship ceremony, rather like those who uh, take British uh, nationality. I've attended some of those ceremonies, and they're very moving. And the people taking part are very serious about what they are doing. And I think that every young person should go through something like that. Because citizenship education should not only prepare them for a world in which they will take part by voting, by participating, by, in many cases, one would hope, answering the call to public service, but it should also make them realize that they have rights, yes, that they do have responsibilities and duties. And I honestly think that if we place more emphasis on citizenship education, we would be going a long way down the route to creating a better society. I also thought that the remarks made by the noble Lord of Dallachia about short sentences were so very pertinent. Wherever possible, young people should be kept out of institutions. I had a young offenders institution in my uh, cons last constituency. It merited a very damning report from the noble Lord, Lord Ramsbottom, when he was uh, the inspector of prisons, and it pulled itself up very considerably, and he was then able to give it a much better report. But a lot of the, many of the young people in that institution became nurtured in crime by being there. And when I was chairman of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee in another place, I saw something of the positive effects of community restorative justice. And I genuinely believe that we ought to place more emphasis on that. And I would ask my noble friend, the minister, to refer to this when she comes to wind up. Any of us uh, who are parents or grandparents in your Lordship's house, it's more the latter than the former, are deeply concerned about our grandchildren growing up into a world where violence is endemic. And it should be our collective, not just wish, not just endeavour, but determination to try and ensure that future generations of school children leave school with a sense of belonging to a community, with a sense of feeling they have an obligation not only to receive but to contribute to that community, and realising that violence, violence of the sort which we've been reading of in the press this very week, is a completely unacceptable way to behave.
Well, as my noble friend uh, Lord Paddock has said in opening this debate, there are many facets to the horrors and challenges of knife crime. One of these is that uh, there is an established link between the very large cuts to local government funding and the increase in knife crime. And at this point, I wish to remind the House of my relevant interests as a local councillor and vice president of the Local Government Association. My Lords, in February this year, a group of major children's charities, Action for Children, Bernardo's, the NSPCC, the Children's Society and the National Children's Bureau, produced a joint report on new analysis of the research they had done on local funding per child. And this is what they found. The funding available to local councils per child has dropped by as much as 52% in real terms. Furthermore, the report stated the view of youth workers and social workers that the dramatic cuts were inextricably linked to a rise in youth knife crime and the criminal exploitation of children by county line gangs. The Local Government Association figures paint a very similar picture. The LGA statistics show that more than 600 youth centres have closed and nearly 139,000 youth service places have been lost between 2012 and 2016 alone. Councils were forced to cut spending on local youth services by 52% from £652 million in 2010 11 to £352 million in 2017 18 as a di direct result of government cuts to local government funding. And the sad fact is that the statistics also demonstrate that early intervention by youth services and youth offending teams, which I'm surprised nobody's mentioned so far today in the debate, can and do significantly reduce the number of young people who become involved in criminal activity and knife crime in particular. Youth services design targeted approaches so that those young people who are more likely to be enticed into, for instance, knife crime, are diverted from it. Youth offending teams both divert young people from criminal activity that may lead to knife crime and can provide support that steers young people away from further involvement in illegal and possibly violent activity. The Action for Children report quoted a youth worker whose role currently is to support victims of stabbing in an A and E in London. And he said, and I quote, young people and their families are not getting the support they need and things are reaching crisis point. Dealing with the issues at A and E is too late. There are consequences to severe cuts in local services and local communities and families are those that are damaged, sometimes beyond repair. Preventative services, such as youth services, are a vital element in keeping individuals and communities safe. One of the key recommendations of the report by the APPG on knife crime is that, as part of the public health approach, the government should use this autumn's expected spending review to provide a considerable increase in funding to youth services so that they can provide safe spaces and access to the support that some young people need. What is so frustrating, my Lords, is that this pattern of large cuts in youth services leading to a rise in young people involved in crime is entirely predictable. It has happened before. The link is known. 
and that makes the continued cuts to local youth services as a consequence of government funding decisions even more to be reprimanded. The government has at least responded in a piecemeal way to the knife crime crisis by providing additional funding to police services. In West Yorkshire, ad hoc funding has enabled early intervention and prevention work with young people, schools and communities to tackle knife crime. Disappointingly though, the funding is one-off and therefore there is no sustainability either in the funding or in the prevention work. It is as if the government sees an horrific problem and throws some one-off funding at it in order to reduce the critical media headlines. What it should and must do is to provide continuing year-on-year -year funding to local government to provide the inter intervention and prevention work that will turn lives around, <coughs> keep young people safe, remove the trauma of violent knife crime from a community and enable young people to turn away from knives. And the win for the government is that this approach costs the public purse less in the long run. Yeah. It is a win-win. The only thing that is surprising is that it is taking the government so long to accept that this challenge is abs this change is absolutely essential. Yeah. 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 To my Lords, I too would like to congratulate Lord Paddock for enabling us to debate this incredibly pressing issue. And I should declare my interest as the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Drug Policy Reform, because that is a subject I want to refer to. Perhaps the most devastating of the many statistics in the first House of Lords library briefing was the fact that the numbers of under-16s admitted to hospital has increased by 93% since 2012. Really quite devastating uh, figure. The government is clearly worried about this and has introduced a wide range of uh, initiatives. And our Home Secretary clearly realises that drugs are absolutely at the heart uh, of this problem and has launched a review of the illegal drugs market by Dame Carol Black. Tragically, her review was castrated before it began by preventing her explicitly from looking at the issue of drug law. Um, uh, without any reform of our drug laws, it is very, very difficult to imagine that this problem can be solved. The government will be s struggling uphill all the way because they, they have this deep problem right at the centre of, of, of everything. Of course, there are very important remedial measures that Dame Carol Black will, will consider. The need to reverse the cuts to drug treatment services, for example. The need to reverse the swinging cuts to local authority budgets, uh, which of course uh, has led to closure of youth services, as Baroness Pinnock has outlined so very, very strongly. These services offer activity, support, and indeed just a little bit of hope to these very vulnerable people. I haven't seen any mention of the need to restore the budgets of schools to enable them to re-employ assistance, school class assistance and indeed others, uh, to, to work with these vulnerable children. I only heard this morning that a school has had to cut, cut out completely, its volunteer uh, programme. Uh, <laughs> It must cost well, three and eight, I mean, almost nothing, and yet they've had to destroy those, that volunteer programme to try and, and make ends meet. And it is these class assistants and volunteers who work with the most vulnerable children who have behaviour problems and who, without that support, are excluded from school. And we've heard the most appalling numbers uh, of exclusions over the past ten years or so. Alongside these policy disasters, which urge, urgently need to be reviewed, in my view, are the cuts to the benefits budget, which have left youngsters looking for some money somewhere. And, of course, it doesn't take them very long to find the illegal drug dealers. 
um, and a veritable gold mine if you're prepared to take a bit of a risk. The Children's Society report on knife crime points to another policy needing revision, the knife crime prevention orders. Branded as preventative, these orders are in fact targeted at children who may themselves be the victims of exploitation. As the Right Reverend Prelate has already noted, the Society rightly points out that any child found carrying a knife should immediately prompt a safeguarding response. And I wonder whether the Minister accepts that rather important recommendation. The Children's Society concerns mirror those expressed in this chamber when that bill was going through uh, this House. Um, and the, uh, the fact is, of course, that the orders risk criminalising young people and pushing them further from support rather than the other way round. Yeah, yeah. And again, does the Minister accept that analysis and the need for revisiting that uh, piece of legislation or at least the regulations within it? But even with these policy changes, if they do occur, the government will be working uphill, as I've said, um, unless it is willing to look at the evidence of the relationship between our drug pro prohibition laws and knife crime uh, and many other societal problems, but today, of course, we're concerned with knife crime. I hope Labour Lords will bear with me if I spend a couple of minutes explaining why I have come to the view, fairly recently, I have to say, that the legalisation of cannabis for adult social use would do more to deal with knife crime than any other initiative. The government seems to accept that most knife crime occurs because youngsters are caught up in drug gangs or carry knives in case they're attacked by a gang, a gang wanting to recruit them. The demand for cannabis is on a different scale from the demand for any other drug. So what would a legal cannabis market look like? The legal cannabis would be a well-balanced, uncontaminated product. Good up-to-date research has shown that that sort of product has no risk of causing psychosis. You know, that there's a lot of, been a lot of publicity about, oh, well, cannabis causes psychosis. No, it absolutely doesn't. The illegal stuff does, but a legal product would not. The only other possible risk of cannabis is of inhibiting brain development in children. If legalization led to more children taking cannabis, I would not support it. But if we look at the US evidence, it suggests that that is simply not the case. In Colorado, the use of cannabis by teenagers has actually fallen. In other legalizing states, it has remained much the same as it was before the change in the law. If the supply of safe cannabis were regulated and available only in pharmacies or other legal outlets, the illegal market would largely collapse. Yes, skunk would continue to be available from the drug dealers, but if young people could get legal stuff safely, from somewhere else, then children would not find their way to those legal, uh, illegal drug dealers. Uh, no doubt children would get hold of the legal product, <coughs> they get hold of alcohol after all, but it would be a very consider considerable amount safer than what they're taking at the moment. Uh, so the important point is that the cannabis they got, got hold of uh, would not be skunk absolutely crucial. Skunk is indeed horrible, dangerous stuff. And what about Class A drugs? Uh, we don't know the proportion of cannabis users who go on to Class A drugs, but we do know that the gateway effect is absolutely crucial. And this would be, this would end. There would be a separate market for legal cannabis and there would be a, a different market for illegal uh, drugs. So I wonder if the Minister um, is, I, I realise the Minister can't respond to any of that sort of thing until we get a new Home Secretary, if we get a new Home Secretary. But I hope that I could have a discussion once we do have a new, new Home Secretary about the possibility of revisiting the terms of reference of the David Dame Carol Black's review. I declare my interest as a Vice President of the Local Government Association. Um, we've heard many, too many of the harrowing statistics about knife crime which is akin to a modern plague on our society. Many speakers have informed us of the awful impact of knife crime. Of course, there are many more young people involved in knife crime than the figures of arrests show. What is the impact on the life of those young people and their families of carrying a knife, whether it be part of a gang or as an individual for self-defence? My Lords, I am sure that none of us can imagine what it must be like to lose a loved one through a fatal stabbing. 
the knock on the door, the police officer standing there with the family liaison officer to tell you that your son or daughter has been stabbed to death. I want to spend my seven minutes drawing on my experiences in local government and, and education to try and understand what is going on and why this is happening and perhaps how we can prevent it. But in my view, it isn't just about the shocking rise in knife crime, but the breakdown of the fabric of many communities and the alienation from those communities of young people, particularly those young people on the margins. When I look back to my childhood, or indeed my children's, I see a very different community experience than those faced by young people today. Many young people in school, and quite a few who aren't in school, of course, will grow up without being able to join a local youth club, unable to go to the after-school club, as most of them are paid for now, without a local library, un unable to afford to go to the leisure centre for or swimming pool, never seeing a detached youth worker or indeed a neighbourhood bobby or community police officer. Last summer, the Children's Commissioner spoke of battery children, children barely leaving their flats during the long summer holidays. What has happened to holiday play schemes provided by local councils in parks and on playing fields? In Liverpool, I can remember marvelling at a national programme called Summer Splash, where young people with student mentors enjoyed engaging, developing and inspiring summer activities. It involved thousands upon thousands of young people for every day of the summer holidays and change their lives for good. That, when, that was when it was fashionable to talk about community development and community cohesion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, ask, today, asking about summer play schemes is now purely a rhetorical question. Local authority budgets, as we've heard from Baroness Pinnock, have been so reduced there is no money left to provide for these positive activities which are now seen by local authorities as unaffordable luxuries. My Lords, many children are growing up in communities where the only contact with the local authority is if they come to the notice of social services, indeed the fourth emergency service. Local councils are having to cut statutory services, let alone sustaining more positive services that can provide or developing policies for community development and community cohesion. My Lords, you may be wondering what all this has to do with knife crime. Well, nothing directly. But what I'm trying to lay out is the sort of community that some people, too many people, grow up in. What we have succeeded in doing is to fragment and destroy much of the fabric of local communities. In tandem with dealing with the immediate, we must attempt to rebuild the infrastructure that will offer children and young people a range of positive activities that offer an alternative to the violent gang culture that in some parts of our cities is becoming normalised. I'm sure that the £40,000 annual cost of a place in a youth offending institution um, would more than cover the cost of a youth worker. Ensuring that just one young person a year did not stab someone is surely worth striving for. We hear a lot about early intervention, and investment in the communities of our young people growing up in is an investment that is worth making in simple economic cost-benefit terms. In human terms, dividends are far greater. <clears throat> My Lords, this debate is about knife crime, but actually it should not be about knife crime. Yeah. That is a symptom, not a cause. Absolutely. Why are we allowing half a million young people, often from the most difficult circumstances, to be excluded from our schools? The Department for, the Educa for Education does not know how many pe children are excluded yeah. or how many are placed in unregistered providers who have never, ever been inspected. You only have to read the House of Commons Select Committee report on alternative school to realise how serious the problem is. Thousands of young people, often from the most disadvantaged circumstances, often with learning and behavioural difficulties, nothing to do, nowhere to go. It's hardly surprising that these young people are drawn into or recruited into gangs, with all that gang culture entails. Integral to that culture is drugs, violence and, of course, knife crime. Is this any way for a society to allow its young people to be treated? Yeah. 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 Gavin Singleton, 31. Kevin Brissett, 
21. Javin Blake, 22. Glenn Broadman, 59. Fahim Hersek, 22. Samuel Barker, 15. Ryan Jowell, 19. And Alan Grayson, 85. Eight lives ended early in my city of Sheffield last year. Eight lives ended early in Sheffield due to knife crime. In a city that is dubbed the safest city in England. I don't congratulate my noble friend, Lord Paddock, for the debate today. I think it is a national shame that we're having to have this debate. I could go through statistics about how Sheffield and South Yorkshire have looked at those carrying knives, aged between 5 and 89. I could go through the statistics as others have regarding deprivation and the other issues. But I want to talk about my time as leader of Sheffield City Council, and I declare my interest in the register as a vice president of the Local Government Association. The most harrowing time was when we started to have a spike in knife crime. And I talked to a victim, a parent, a perpetrator, and an ex-offender. The victim, now scared to go out. And if he did, he was going to carry a knife. The parent, who I, I have to tell you, I've never experienced anything like it in my life, a parent who had lost their child. There is no words. It is harrowing. And the perpetrator who felt as though he had no other option. And the thing that bound them together was a lack of hope, a sense of helplessness, a sense of despair that they had no power to control how they got themselves out of this mess. And then I met an ex-offender. Ex <laughs> he was the one with hope. He was the one that had power. He was the one who felt there was a future for him. And I came away and reflected. And I have to say, government and the statutory sector in itself does not own this issue in terms of solving the problem. Yeah, yeah. We have to wrap around communities rather than communities wrapping around us. That is the lesson that I have learnt. This cannot be a top-down approach. And I am absolutely appalled that some of the approaches from the government is a bidding process to save lives. Absolutely. That is unacceptable. And I find it despicable, my lords, that we are saying that the only way to fund communities is to bid to save your children. It has to be, as my noble friend, Lord, uh, the Baroness um, Pinnock said, it has to be sustainable funding. And one of the issues that government and local authorities should be judged on is how much of the third sector is involved, how they are empowered, how parents, children, ex-offenders are empowered to deliver the solutions not how statutory organisations get tick box exercises for how they spend money. I also have to say, in my professional life, I work across the world looking at government reform. This government and previous governments are not dealing with this in a systematically joined up way. A task force is not good enough. It has to be something akin to what was called Troubled Families, which was a much more systematic approach and joined-up approach. And government in that approach should not be judging the process. It should be allowing innovation at the local level and only be judging communities and the statutory sector on outcome, not getting involved in how, why or what. I trust parents, I trust some ex-offenders to have a far greater understanding of what's needed in the communities of this country than some official or some minister sat here in Whitehall. And we must empower them and we must allow, it, we must allow them the freedom to deliver solutions. The other learning 
that I came away with from my time as a councillor and as leader of Sheffield City Council is that some of the people who get drawn into this, the youngest person carrying a knife recently in Sheffield was five years old. Over a quarter of knife reported crimes were in schools, some of them primary schools. This has to start at a very early age. This is about wrapping around families so parents can get the support, not to do with knife crime, but actually about support of nurturing, of love, of hope, of giving them practical skills. That is what is needed. And school exclusions are the breeding ground of gangs and dysfunctional families. And local authorities need power to deal with academies and free schools who more or less have free reign to exclude. There needs to be legislation for local authorities to have a role in making sure that exclusions do not happen. If one thing comes from this, I would suggest that. Because if you need police to deal with knife crime, we have failed as a society. This needs a much more systematic approach. It needs a much more bottom-up approach. It needs to allow innovation in communities. It needs to be a whole family approach. And it needs to listen to the voices of those without hope, with, who feel disempowered, and who feel the only option is to pick up a knife to give them some form of safety in future. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lord, I'd also like to thank Lord Paddock for this useful opportunity, I think, to reflect on how the government's strategy uh, is going forward, having been announced last year in terms of serious uh, violence strategy uh, in trying to reduce knife crime. And I do believe the government has taken some useful action uh, which have been effective in reducing knife crime, but I do also believe that there remain significant questions about whether their approach will be successful in the longer term. Sometimes today it's felt in the debate as though there are alternates, as though we do short-term things or we do long-term things. I'm afraid the reality is we're going to have to do both, because if we don't do some of the short-term things, people die, while some of the long-term things take effect. So I think there are going to have to be some tactical responses, as well as some of the more profound strategic things. And I certainly would continue to urge the government to have a profound prevention strategy around crime, which I honestly don't think is in place. Uh, it can also be said of health, but it's certainly true around crime, uh, which should have five elements around design of place and things, around drug abuse, around alcohol misuse, um, around mental health, um, and finally, self-education, so that people can sometimes protect themselves from becoming victims. And although the debate has veered today, quite understandably, into looking at economic circumstances and the level of government support for individuals and people who are vulnerable, um, the debate is about the impact of government policy on knife crime. And while certainly economic low vibrancy can lead to more crime, this is particularly about how is that situation affecting knife crime? Why is it disproportionately causing people uh, to stab each other, particularly young people? So I think the effective measures that are being taken are to find an extra £1 billion of something of that order for police funding, uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, an increase in the average sentence for those convicted of a second offence of knife crime. I know my friend Lord Delacchia uh, is not persuaded, and others are not persuaded, that uh, prison sentences are the answer. But they certainly have to be part of the answer, where someone, as I think Lord Delacchia acknowledged, if someone's been stabbed or there is a serious violence offence, then the young need to know that this is a terrible thing and they need to know there is a serious consequence in the most extreme case. And it's only on the second conviction uh, that this will happen. And in fact, the average sentence has run to eight months. And of course, the dilemma here is that someone carrying a knife before they stab someone to arrest and to take uh, some serious action then is a preventative measure to prevent the, the murder that may subsequently occur. And if we, only, if we take no serious action about carrying a knife, then we will have problems. I also think the initiation of local serious crime uh, violence units to work long term on a public health approach, which Lord Paddock has talked about, I think is a good investment. And I'm sure in the coming years uh, we will see the benefits. I do not necessarily share the uh, confidence that we've heard about the data we're offered to decide whether or not things are getting better or worse. I think the reports by the Library here in the Lords is, is very good. But it's based on a data that concludes in December of 2018. And here we are in June, June 2019. And we know that someone stabbed to death yesterday. 
We don't know whether or not things are getting better or worse. Surely that data should be available. Often the statisticians want it, this data to be perfect, but some of the data has to be available and transparent so that we know whether things are getting better or worse. I ho certainly hope the government has that data and certainly well, believe the police should have it to know whether or not the action they're taking uh, is helpful. And we also need to have statistical information because it helps us to stop having a moral crisis about something that may actually be just a blip. Now, I don't think this is a blip, but there are ways statistically of actually checking that. Because otherwise, this type of crime is seasonal. When it gets warm, it's a different sort of uh, profile. Certain things can affect crime, um, which can be looked at in terms of statistical analysis. But the bottom line is every murder is serious, every stabbing is a serious event that we all are and need to take uh, seriously. Now, my uh, analysis, which is supported by the serious crime uh, strategy uh, analysis, is that the, reason, the four principal causes of what we're seeing at the moment is, one, the increase in supply of cheap cocaine, which has destabilised the controlled drug market, leading to more violence. Secondly, the distribution methods have changed so that now there is online ordering and delivery to the customer rather than collection by them from their dealer. And the very young are becoming involved in that, and that is leading to the county lines issue that we're seeing right across the country. Clearly, too many young people are carrying knives, and they're neither deterred uh, that they're going to be caught or the consequences of being caught. Uh, and finally, we see communities who, where they're growing younger, uh, are seeing higher incidence of violence. So the questions I think that remain for the government is that, first of all, there have been two things that have been in their control which have aggravated the situation I've described. One is the loss of 20,000 police officers. And I'm afraid I still can't understand if the government's putting £1 billion in, why they only promised 3,500 more, when they cost on average about £50,000 each. Because a billion should provide about 20,000. And I don't understand why there is such a big discrepancy between the promise and the money that's being put in there. And secondly, the point that's been picked up by many people, the exclusion of young people from schools and the limited effect effectiveness of the pupil referral units which I'm afraid are becoming get pathways to crime rather than inhibitors of it. So I think the questions that remain, therefore, for the government are these. If it's true that a police officer costs an average £50,000, why can't they promise more officers? And when they arrive, can they give some kind of assessment from the police about where they're going to put them? Because if they end up being shared politically or equitably, that will not be the right way, in my view, to distribute them. Secondly, the National Crime Agency, which is charged with stopping the importation of drugs, still doesn't have a tier one objective to try to supply, to control the supply of controlled drugs. It's got a very vague set of words, and the performance data is almost meaningless. But actually, what about stopping some of the drugs getting in? How much is getting stopped, seized, people arrested, put in prison for 80 kilos of heroin? These are vitally important things that all the NCA should have, and the government hasn't given them an objective to explicitly stop that supply. Has the government uh, considered amending the criteria for intrusive surveillance to monitor online ordering? At the moment, it's reserved for the most serious of crimes, 80 kilos of heroin being imported. But in these cases, you can have very low volumes of cocaine being delivered, and somebody dies, a 16-year-old dies who's delivered it. That's a serious event which is why the intrusive surveillance is so important to make sure that it matches the nature of the problem. Fourthly, what is the government's analysis of the adverse impact on the educational performance indicators on exclusions from schools, and what are they doing to improve the performance of pupil referral units? Fifthly, what technology has been avail made available to the uh, police to improve the quality of stop search? Because that can make a real difference, um, I think, uh, in the future. And finally, um, I recently did a documentary TV programme. I suggested there was a czar who actually gathered this, pulled this thing together. As a result, I saw the Home Secretary who said he didn't agree with czars. Well, as it happens, I'm not sure I'm entirely uh, confident that czars always work. But if they don't like czars, who's pulling this lot together? Who's going to drive it forward? And who's going to make sure that across government, somebody's going to do something week by week and day by day? Not reporting six monthly time, in six months' time, when sadly things get out of control. It needs a drive, and contrary to Lord Wasserman, sometimes central government can actually make things happen. My Lords, uh, when I put my name down for this debate, I had a series of points I was going to raise, most of which, of course, have been covered. Uh, the basic premise, though, from reading through all the information is that the knife crime, the knife crime, well, let's hope it's a spike, 
as well as an upward trend. It's something which merely ties into what has been happened before. The profile of the offender is almost exactly the same as it's always been. First common denominator, you're out of school by 14. That is the one that's always been there. Anybody who has worked in prisons at any time has discovered incredibly low levels of educational attainment and a fear of authority. I mean, it's only when I've been working there that I have been threatened and groveled to in the same sentence in a youth offending unit. There are people who are difficult to reach. And one of the contributing factors is clearly the fact that in our current education system, it has become okay to get rid of your failing pupils. Off-rolled, excluded, you name it, you get rid of them because of the way we're going through here. Okay, the minister looked shocked. I didn't say the government had done it. It has become something that schools have had to do to preserve their status. Academisation, losing your academy status, going through that argument has clearly had an effect here. There can be no real argument with that, my lords. There is something down there. You're going to punish a school, change its status if you get bad results. The pupil who is not going to get your five C's, whatever it is now, five fours, I think it will be in the exam system my daughter is going to present to me in August. <laughs> if you've got those down there, if you're not achieving that total and there is a punishment down there, the perverse incentive is absolutely there. Very good schools will resist it, but it'll still be there. Now, my lords, of course, people have always excluded themselves from school. There's always been the people who didn't like it. You don't want him there, just go away. It's always happened, but it's becoming more prevalent, and exclusions themselves are rising. So we have this lovely growth of the, for, if you want to exploit uh, this for criminal reasons or for social reasons, I believe my, if I remember correctly, as my noble friend said, you know, you know fashion and fear carry those blades down there. It's always been there. It is now more common. So we're going through. So we have this horrible situation where you've, you've actually got something has become more prevalent, has become more exploited, and then gangs who are moving in to take exploitation for a criminal activity. Drugs has been mainly spoken about, but there will be other areas of activity as well. So what do we do to try and get out of it? Well, one of the things that civil society can do is encourage those people who are very good at reaching these groups. And sport is one of them. It sounds a little bit like you're going to say, oh, if everybody played jolly good sport and had a cold shower afterwards, everything would fight. <laughs> My Lords, having had the cold shower, believe me, it doesn't help you turn up the next time. But certain sports, all of them do. They all have a cohesive effect. They have an objective. They have a discipline inside there. And bizarrely, my Lords, from uh, certain attitudes taken by the government, boxing and martial arts are the best for reaching this group. It just is. Learning how not to get punched in the nose is a great way to make sure you are less likely to get involved in violence. You are there, you have a community, you have a group, you have a reason to stay fit. If you're staying fit, you're not hanging around drinking and taking drugs on street corners. If you do, when you go into the gym, you will get hit. There we are, great incentive for you. If you've got this there, what are we doing to encourage this? We could actually bring this into bo boxing into prisons, but we don't like that, apparently, because it encourages violence. My Lords, uh, possibly somebody should have a look at that at some point. But the martial arts actually are a very good way in. Other sports do it. Basketball, for instance, or other good urban sports will actually have the opportunities as well. But the lead one seems to be boxing. Are we going to encourage the, these groups to actually integrate with the rest of the society? There's a very good organisation called Fight for Peace. It grew itself out of the... Uh, activity that based the centre I saw down in the Docklands area of London uh, came out of the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. There, it, because boxing was acceptable, you could cross gang lines. And my lords, if you want to look at real problems when you get this wrong, look there. It's not a couple of people with knives, it's people with automatics and spare clips of ammunition on street corners and the police go in in armoured cars. So, just bear in mind that it can get worse. What are we doing to help groups like this 
who actually encourage in to their gyms and their training sessions the social workers, the people with career support, the people who are going down to make sure these people can re-engage. Because you have a way in. All sports have this. Boxing may have the best one. But the, anything that will do to build on what you're doing out there will work. Because what you're actually saying is re-engage in society. The people around you who you respect, who aren't the establishment, who aren't the teacher who failed you, they're going to be the people who come in and say, you can succeed. Bring in people who actually have the same accent as them to tell them you can succeed and help. That is a way forward. What are we doing to actually encourage these groups to have easy access to what the state can do to support and help them? This is a real question, my lords. We do it in small pockets and we say, wonderful, isn't it great? Leave and don't change the rest of our activity. Ministers will have to lead this because you will actually always be punching through the Chinese walls of that's not my budget or I don't get the credit for it. I think everybody in Parliament can make a 10-minute speech on that subject any day of the week. What is the government going to do to make sure that good community projects can become part of this public health solution, which seems to be the only one we've identified? What are we doing to make sure it happens? Because if we're not going to get embraced with this, we are probably going to end up losing out on one of our quick wins. Yeah. My Lords, um, this has been a, a very constructive debate, and the way it was introduced invited a, a cross-party approach, which I think we should carry forward. Um, I agree with Lord Brown about the quality of the briefing that we've received, and I think it is, it's a very good idea to, to, uh, for the House Authority to look at, that those briefings should actually be lodged in the library uh, and become available, um, because uh, they have been extremely good. Um, my locus in, in speaking is um, that I was for three and a half years a minister at the Ministry of Justice, and then a further three years as chairman of the Youth Justice Board. Um, along th through this period when um, almost all budgets at all levels have, have been uh, cut. Um, and I do think we have to take into mind that, that it was a period when we were um, recovering from the coronary thrombosis the financial system had in 2008. Uh, I think people sometimes do um, forget that in terms of, of what all government expenditure was uh, from 2010 on onwards. Um, but let me concentrate on, on just three areas um, where I may, that experience may be able to help. First of all, certainly the period that I was chairman of the Youth Justice Board were among the most fulfilling and constructive uh, of my life. Um, I think we have got a great asset in the Youth Justice Board um, and I think Charlie Taylor's um, hope and intention to move from what we have now, which are in fact child prisons, to places of more constructive rehabilitation for young offenders should be uh, supported and encouraged. I also think, although they too have had the pressure of um, the uh, squeeze on resources, youth offending <coughs> teams are, are amazingly effective uh, and exactly what has come through in, in this debate today because they are um, they're cross disciplinary, uh, including experts from all aspects of uh, local uh, authority and policing mm -hmm. and the cross referencing of, of um, uh, the work is, is one that produces results. One thing that always sticks in my mind uh, was a visit to Manchester where one very persistent young um, uh, offender from a local uh, uh, care home. Um, the policeman on the uh, yacht saw him for the first time and said that kid's autistic and he was. 
but he seemed to have gone through a whole lot of his life and a whole lot of experts without anybody noticing. Uh, and it's this crash referencing of the yachts and the local, again, the, the point that's been made again, the localism of their experience, which, which gives them their strength. I want to say also a little bit about, about the uh, police. I know that uh, when he was uh, uh, head of the uh, police in London, uh, Lord Hogan Howe was uh, very committed to uh, policemen, uh, police uh, uh, at attached to schools. Uh, and I was very pleased when I attended uh, a lecture the other night by uh, Cressida Dick that she is keeping up that uh, commitment of putting the policeman in a school with a contact with that, uh, with that local community. And I think that is, again, something that gives us um, uh, hope. But I do think that the police still have a real problem with recruitment. Forty years ago, in the other place, I asked a question about why uh, police recruitment from black and ethnic minorities was so low. I made the same point 20 years ago when I was first into this place. And it still worries me that we are trying to police black and Asian communities with white police forces. And uh, the, the, each police chief gives me assurances about what they're doing for recruit. But recruitment and retention is still poor. And it still worries me. One of the things that most struck me was I, I had a visit from some local uh, government workers from Birmingham and there was one of them was an Asian lady and she um, we it so happened that uh, um, uh, our children were about the same age and uh, uh, she uh, she said oh yes she said yeah, he, he uh, my son he, he really wants to become a policeman and then she hesitated and they said of course he, he couldn't say that down at the mosque and it's then to shiver through my spirit, uh, through my spine, that, that there is still this feeling that the police are them, and in many of these communities, uh, and David Lammy's report uh, warned us of that as well. And I, I think we've got to persevere with recruiting and retaining people from these communities so that the police force is not seen as some outside force, but as part of their community. Um, Finally, can I just re-echo the, the importance of, of sport? Um, when I arrived at the MOJ, I, I said I was told there was no evidence that sport could be um, influential in rehabilitation. Well, it seems silly because all my life I've seen kids who could have gone wrong, who weren't, because for, for, for all the reasons that Lord Addington uh, and one of the most um, uh, influential youth workers I ever saw uh, was somebody straight out of central casting up in Durham who was running a boxing club. And my God, did he get respect and did he look after those kids? I'm not going to get the flashing, uh, but I do think that we might uh, take some money from uh, the betting industry and from our wealthy football industry uh, to put into some of these youth services that have been so depleted. Yeah. My Lords, I need to declare an interest as a trustee of Safer London, which works with young people affected or potentially affected by the issues we've been discussing. The um, title that my noble friend chose for his debate, I think, is very neat. The impact of government policy on knife crime, knife crime. and noble lords have addressed both knife crime policy and government policies and actions and omissions in other parts of the policy landscape which affect knife crime. Um, and the debate has illustrated how knife crime is a symptom, not a cause. I've been wondering about the situation in other countries and what one might learn from there. I'd hope someone might talk this afternoon about Scotland. Um, we can do without Mr. Trump slagging off Mayor Khan uh, and describing our hospitals as a sea of blood, but I mustn't get diverted onto that. Um, 
we've been briefed on <coughs> headline statistics and we do need to the detail and to identify trends and spikes. I was struck, of course, by the correlation between cuts in youth services and the highest knife crime increases, and struck by the impact of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. I think it's significant when technical terms, quasi-technical terms, enter the more general lexicon. Um, teachable and reachable moments, trauma-informed or others. I don't want to lose sight of the fact that not all victims and perpetrators are young. Currently, a 36-year-old is on trial for killing a 51-year-old in a row on a train. Using a knife seems to have become normalised, a term which the noble Lord, Lord Cormac used, I think. It bears repeating, of course, that perpetrators are often victims too, because that directs us to the, the why. My noble friend Baroness Pinnock powerfully and accurately talked about local authority funding and funding per child. I've always thought that local authorities should be able to be at the heart of both action and prevention and the noble Lord Lord Wasserman referred to the local nature of these issues. My noble friend um, Lord Storey talked about the um, about schools, about um, action taken in schools, um, and the alienation of young people. What are the views of young people? They should be encouraged to contribute to societies. Response. I was struck by Baroness Meacher's phrase, the importance of hope. We do know that many young people carry knives for their own protection. And I have to say that if you think that protection from the police is not available, that's not an irrational thing to do. The Home Office talk, pretty good talk actually, about what they are going to do. I may well be wrong about this, but I think I've only heard the phrase public health approach from the government in the context of its recent consultation on a possible new statutory duty to have due regard to the prevention and tackling of serious violence. It seems in the consultation to have been used as a synonym for multi-agency. And I wonder whether the Minister is able um, to tell the House uh, this afternoon Firstly, when the government um, will respond to what it's heard through that consultation process, maybe she'll even be able to trail part of the response. Does she, do the government, support an approach which views violence like a contagious disease which transmits and spreads based on exposure to violence to which Lord Brown, Noble Lord, Lord Brown referred, and is preventable at the point of transmission with early intervention. Um, does she, does the government, agree that the government should set out what an effective public health response looks like and how it should apply at a departmental level? My noble friend Lord McNally talked about sentencing and what works. Um, detention too often doesn't, though sometimes indeed it is unavoidable. Believing you're likely to be caught is a better deterrent. Um, we might not want to admit to it as individuals, but we all know other drivers who are more deterred um, from speeding by the thought of being caught than the impact, uh, sorry, that was not intended as a pun, the effect of what might happen, the greater the speed at which they drive. And children, we understand, make assessments in a different way from adults. Fear for their own safety outweighs other factors. Detention is not rehabilitate, rehabilitative. We've so often made clear from these benches, as my noble friend Lord Delacchia did today, um, our views on short sentences. I don't suppose that um, it will now harm the career prospects of um, David Gork or Rory Stewart if I express um, appreciation of them. 
Um, my Lords, does stop and search work? We're not keen on Section 60 powers, um, but still, perhaps therefore, we're concerned about how the community reacts to the new pilots, how officers conduct themselves, because trust in the police must not be jeopardised. Stop and search has a form. Of course, we were going to have to discuss police funding and that additional funding must be sustainable, looking for more officers, not the same number of officers doing more, I would say even more, over time. And on funding, can the Minister um, give the, the House uh, some sort of breakdown of the £100 million of the Serious Violence Fund? What's it being spent on? What's planned? How and when? I'd like myself to understand more about violence reduction units. Lord Hogan House says they're a good investment. I hope so. Funding for 18, I think, has been announced. Can the minister expand on this? Because there is so much for them to consider. Links with the criminal exploitation of children through organised crime, that homeless people, homeless young people, who are particularly hard to reach, are conversely particularly easily exploited. That gangs are to many of their members, their family, providing a sense of purpose and role models, um, and respect, as my, my noble friend said. That young people need communication skills. The briefing from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists should not have been unexpected. I really welcomed it. And that services should not be concentrated geographically, otherwise, to quote, 50% can't access them because of rivalries. Um, my Lords, there's been reference to the what is now the Offensive Weapons Act, which felt very much a knee-jerk populist response, hey. particularly KCPOs, um, which are not a new category for the honours system, though maybe in some eyes they are. My loss, the public health <laughs> approach takes time and painstaking effect. The government can't do it themselves. They need to involve civil society, and when we discuss funding, we mustn't, as my noble friend Lord Scriven reminds us, forget the third sector. Their organisations need core funding to survive, yeah, yeah, yeah. to be able to provide particular services, and no yeah. doubt that applies to <coughs> boxing clubs just as yeah, much as yeah, any yeah, other. One-to-one yeah. -one work is very intensive and needs to involve the whole family, and I don't mean the gang. As the right reverend prelate says, so much of our debate leads us back to safeguarding, to contextual safeguarding, where the risks and the environment are viewed through a child protection lens. The debate is about knife crime. The debate is also about child protection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, could I uh, add my congratulations to those already expressed to the noble Lord Lord Paddock on uh, securing this debate. His opening speech was as thoughtful and comprehensive as one expected it would be. Judging by the number of briefings we've all received, the debate and its subject matter has attracted a lot of interest and particularly amongst those organisations who are directly involved in seeking through various means and approaches to counteract the driving forces behind knife crime and to reduce its incidence. The library briefing for this debate refers to recent ONS statistics which indicate that in the year to December 2018 the police recorded 44,443 offences involving a knife or sharp instrument, a volume rise of 6% on the previous year and the continuation of a four-year rising trend. Possession offences of an article with a blade or point also rose last year by 20% to just under 21,000 in line with increases seen over the last five years. Ministry of Justice figures on cautions and convictions for knife and offensive weapon offences reflect the increases in the police figures, as do NHS figures for admissions for, quote, assault by a sharp object. The ONS figures show that urban areas have generally seen the highest rates of knife crime over recent years, with young people increasingly involved in knife crime 
both as perpetrators and victims. In the year to March 2018, the number of homicide victims aged 16 to 24 increased by 45% compared to the previous year, with the number of homicides committed by under 18s rising by 77% between 2016 and 2018. The figures would have been even higher were it not for medical advancements, which have led to significant improvements in survival rates for stabbings. The number of under 16s admitted to hospital due to knife attacks has also increased by 93% since 2012, as the noble lady Baroness Meacher mentioned. The driving forces behind knife crime are numerous and have to be looked at in totality if the issues we now face are to be uh, addressed. A review in one London borough of 60 serious cases of youth violence has apparently shown that in nearly all, if not all, cases, the young person involved was outside mainstream education. Further common factors were the absence of the mother for one reason or another, and the lack in most cases of a trusted adult, whether from within the family or from outside. And the noble Lord, Lord Paddock, mentioned other factors, living with a background of domestic violence, divorce, parental mental health issues, alcohol issues, a parent in prison, and parents having to work for excessive hours just to make ends meet, all resulting in emotional neglect. The noble Lord, Lord Paddock and uh, others have uh, referred also to uh, the impact of drugs and county lines and the attractions and dangers of gangs to many young people. There's also the question of school exclusions. Some schools make temporary or permanent exclusions that run into three figures in a year. Others make only a handful or even none at all. That suggests very different approaches are being adopted. And it's difficult to believe that frequent exclusions and permanent exclusions have increased by over 50% in the last three years are helping to address the driving factors behind knife crime. Indeed, they appear to be a contributory factor. Why is it that some schools can apparently largely avoid exclusions without it leading to disruption of classes for other children, whilst other schools apparently cannot? Roughly a half of exclusions are of children with special needs, and one must question whether enough is being done in many of these cases through interventions to endeavour to keep such young people in mainstream schools. Another potential issue is the effectiveness or otherwise of pupil referral units, an issue to which the noble Lord Lord uh, Hogan Howe referred. A third of local authorities, it appears, do not even have any places left in their units. Does the government actually have any information on the quality and effectiveness of pupil refer referral units? Are we in a situation where many are good, but still too many are not delivering for the young people who are the most vulnerable and most likely to end up committing offences. Pupil referral units, I believe, tend to finish earlier than mainstream schools, so that young people concerned are potentially likely to be on the streets for longer. My understanding is that the evidence shows that knife offences peak after school and in the time before parents come home from work, after which the number of such offences goes down again. If that's the case, Surely something can be done to address this reality and the impact it's having on the incidence of knife offences. The uh, Right Reverend Predit, the Bishop of St Albans, uh, confirmed that the Church of England is looking to see if more can be done to keep churches open during these hours after school so that they can be a form of safe haven for young people who feel vulnerable and at risk and have no trusted adult available to turn to during these seemingly particularly crucial hours. Churches and other places of worship can only have their doors open during hours when that is not currently the situation. If there are sufficient suitable people who are able to make themselves available to be inside the place of worship to offer comfort and assurance. That may be easier said than done in many instances, but such an initiative can only be welcomed as positive action as opposed to mere words to address the problem we are discussing. Much has already been said about the public health approach, meaning active coordinated interventions to reduce and stop the violence and prevent its future spread, and also changing attitudes and mindsets to prevent it starting up again. My noble friend Lord Brown of Ladyton referred to the approach adopted in Glasgow 
and the considerable favourable impact it has had, which has led to people from the south hot-footing it north to find out how it has been achieved. The library briefing tells us that as part of the Knife Free campaign, the Home Office has worked with schools and the Personal Social Health and Economic Association to provide new material on knife crime ahead of the 2019 summer holidays. At the beginning of this month, as I understand it, 20,000 PSHE teachers received new lesson plans to help, quote, further equip them to challenge myths and communicate to their pupils the realities of carrying a knife, close quote. Significantly, in the light of the government presiding over a rundown in Shore Start centres over the last 10 years, the lessons are for children aged between 11 and 16 years old. These lessons are no doubt also a part of the government's serious violence strategy. But what are the specific short and long-term aims of the strategy? What are the specific goals it is intended to achieve? Against what criteria will its impact or lack of impact be able to be assessed. In a debate in the Commons on knife crime on the 24th of January, the Commons Minister said that, and I quote, nationally we have Operation Scepter, where every single police force in the country has a week of action of tackling knife crime in a way that is appropriate for their local area, close quote. Well, that sounds fine. But what's happening to tackling knife crime on the other 51 weeks in the year? Why doesn't Operation Skepta, to which the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, made reference earlier, operate every week of the year if it is effective? Is it lack of resources? And this is the problem the government has not yet addressed. It is about resources. Resources to enable the public health approach to be meaningful and to enable the necessary action to continue to be taken and not just undertaken for a limited period of time, following which the resources dry up and the problems promptly start to resurface again. The Home Secretary has now accepted that we need to put back the approximately 20,000 police officers who have been cut since 2010. Neighbourhood policing has been decimated, and with it a vital link between local communities and the police, which not only delivered increased trust in the police in local communities, but also as a result provided much needed knowledge and intelligence to counteract crime and more significantly prevent crime happening in the first place. The government has also presided over a rundown in our youth services over the last 10 years through its squeeze on local authority finances. Youth services which provide valuable support for potentially vulnerable young people as well as a support of constructed activity off the streets. I'm involved with the Football League with 82 clubs in London and the South East. Most of our clubs run teams um, for all the younger age groups. And uh, I don't think their contribution through volunteers to the well-being and development of young people is recognised as fully as it should by government and sometimes by the relevant local authority. Our education system is facing real financial pressure as a result of insufficient government funding since 2010, which restricts the level of support which can be offered to the more vulnerable students, as well as making the teaching proposed by the noble Lord, Lord Cormac, unlikely at present. The uh, Conservative Party leadership campaign has led to a mini blizzard of additional spending uh, pledges in areas such as defence and tax cuts for the better off. The Home Secretary has now, in effect, as I've said, admitted that cutting police numbers by some 20,000 was a mistake, since he's advocated reinstating them. What we haven't heard, though, from the main candidates are any pledges to provide the substantial coordinated resources and activity that will be needed to address for good, and not just in a piecemeal way, the problems we are addressing today. The Government has to move on from poring over spreadsheets in the Treasury in order to cut, cut and cut again and recognise the reality that excessive short-term savings eventually lead to even more excessive long-term costs, both financial and even more damagingly social and human, as this debate today has highlighted. My Lords, may I start by thanking um, the Noble Lord, Lord Paddock, for uh, 
calling this debate on the impact of government policy on knife crime. And could I also thank all noble lords who have taken part in this very important and wide-ranging debate uh, and join in the noble lord, Lord Paddock, um, in commending organisations like Red Thread for the invaluable work that they do in, in, in many cases saving young people's lives. Um, a comment was made by the noble Lord, Lord Brown of Ladyston about the briefings. I would love House authorities to make those briefings available online because sometimes as ministers you don't actually get them. Um, so I have absolute full support for that. Um, but may I agree with many of the sentiments that have been expressed this afternoon, uh, particularly on the complexity of this matter, as the noble Lord, Lord Rosser said. The violence we are seeing on our street is a major concern to us all, with people becoming both victims and perpetrators, uh, as the noble Lord, Lord Delacchia, Baroness Hamway and the noble Lord, Lord Rosser said. We have heard today uh, about the victims of knife crime that um, noble Lord, Lord Scriven so movingly talked about in, in his area of Sheffield and their families, and of course our hearts go out to all of those who have been affected by violence. There was one such incident the other week, it literally around the corner from my house, and I can't be begin to imagine the pain and the suffering of parents and families who have lost their loved ones. The noble Lord, Lord Paddock, also spoke of the latest such tragic incident here in London, reported just this morning. Uh, and the noble Lord, Lord Brown of Ladyton spoke of the cycle of repeated offending that needs to be stopped in its, tract, its tracks and prevented by a public health approach. And the noble Lord, Lord Russell, is right um, that people are hot-footing it up to Scotland um, just to um, see the fantastic work that has been done up there. And the Home Secretary has described knife crime as a national emergency and one that we must tackle head on. And that's why the government has put in place a major programme to tackle knife crime and serious violence on a range of fronts. This absolutely includes supporting the police uh, in taking the action needed to address the violence that we are seeing, as, the noble Lord, uh, as my noble friend Lord Wasserman said. But as we've heard today, tough in enforcement, important though it is, is not the whole solution at all. My noble friend Lord Wasserman talked about the two-pronged uh, approach, both national uh, and local, to address this problem, and I agree. And <coughs> my noble Lord, Lord Hogan Howe, talked about both the short and long-term uh, approach, and um, who is better to know than he, um, and I pay tribute to the work that he did that brought down the uh, incidents of night crime here in the capital. And if I could start from the, uh, the national approach, um, my Lords, I think this out outlines why the Government's Serious Violence Strategy, which was published last April, balances the need for tough law enforcement with a greater emphasis on prevention and early intervention to stop <coughs> excuse me, young people being drawn into violence in the first place before it is too late. It's also clear that it's not just a matter for the police, but it does need to be a multi-agency approach, as so many noble lords have said today, so that we can tackle violent crime and its causes effectively. I was um, disappointed um, to hear the noble Lord, Lord Paddock, being critical of the government strategy in this House, as in setting out his approach today, I don't think we're actually uh, that far apart. The ser serious violence strategy sets out the overall approach that the gov government is taking, and it stresses the importance of a multi-agency response with education, health, and social services, housing, youth services, all playing their part, as the Bishop of St Albans, the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of St Albans said. Um, noble Lady, Lady Hamway, asked me about the consultation on the public health approach. It's only just closed, um, as she will know, uh, but we will respond to it in due course. The strategy also underlines the importance of tackling the drivers of serious violence, recognising, for example, how change, changes to the drug 
markets that noble Lord, Lord Hogan Howe talked about today and has talked about previously, and the spread of county lines uh, are driving much of the serious violence that we are seeing, as my noble friend Lord Cormac said. Um, noble Lord, uh, Lord Hogan Howe talked about the upstream effort to actually prevent the importation of drugs, and um, I know that he will be pleased to hear that um, 2.1 tonnes of cocaine uh, have just been seized uh, in Cornwall, uh, which, is, which is a very good outcome. That's just the latest um, uh, seizure. Um, as a noble lady, uh, Lady Meacher said, the Home Secretary has appointed Professor Dame Cara Black to undertake an important and independent review of drugs which will form our, inform our approach going forward. And I note her disappointment um, that drug law is not part of the scope, but I do admire her um, persistence in, 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 in raising this at um, appropriate moments. Um, we don't have any intention to change the law to legalise illicit drugs. Um, but again, of course, I'm very happy. Um, I'd be very happy to meet with her um, if she would like me to do so. Um, the uh, I was just I was like, and the the noble lord lord uh, Scriven talked about the troubled families and what a great program it was. It absolutely was a brilliant program. I was in DCLG at the time, and I was really compelled by the, effectively, the public health approach that it took uh, for families for whom there may be several interventions from different agencies um, all the time, but this took a whole family uh, approach. And I'm pleased to say it is still going, um, and, um, and, and I really agree with him on that point. Um, I hope that Noble Lords um, will help, find it helpful if they now, now provide an update on the progress that we are uh, making. Um, particularly the noble lord, Lord Brown, who, of Lady Tim, who asked me to outline it. Um, if I could talk first about uh, early in intervention and prevention, um, noble lords, uh, Lord Storey, Lord Pinnock, Lord, lord Brown, and Lady Tim, and indeed um, noble lord, Lord Rosser, have all asked about this. Firstly, our focus on prevention includes the £22 million Early Intervention Youth Fund, which is supporting approaches that work with young people at risk of criminal involvement, gang exploitation or county lines to turn away from violence before it takes a grip. Noble Lords may have seen that the Home Secretary announced yesterday that a further 11 projects will re receive funding this year from that fund, the Early Intervention Youth Fund, in addition to the 29 projects in England and Wales that have already received funding. And that's in addition to the £200 million Youth Endowment Fund. This major new fund is about long-term change that Noble Lords have talked about delivering a 10-year programme of grants that will enable interventions targeted at children and young people who are most at risk and to act as a centre of expertise. And the government's approach includes the knife-free uh, campaign that Noble Lord, Lord Rosser mentioned. It's mostly on social media, which is working to educate young people of the dangers of carrying knives using real-life examples to challenge the false perception that knife carrying uh, somehow makes you cool, safer, or that everyone is doing it. And he talked about that they're doing it in the lead-up to the summer holidays, and what about the other 51 weeks of the year? He's right, but the summer, summer holidays it, it can be a particular flashpoint uh, for issues like this, um, but it is not that we take a one-year, one-week approach. It, it, it is that some of our campaigns are, are, are timed for when the dangers might be highest. Um, I have to absolutely uh, agree with the noble old Lord McNally and Addington about the importance of sport for young people. And um, I, I might, have, might have told this story before, but I remember when my son went into secondary school and the headmaster said, never worry that your son is doing too much sport. He was so right. And um, I think that sport not only improves mental health of people, but it keeps them um, in a sort of routine, uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and of course it's a, it's a great achievement um, for, for some of the, uh, the things that you can go on to do uh, within sport. Um, 
Noble Lord, um, Lords Paddock, De Luckier, Rossa, Hogan, Howe uh, talked about supporting the police. Of course, if we don't support the police, um, uh, it, this problem is going to get worse. And I know that the Home Secretary, my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has, has absolutely uh, acknowledged the demands that are being placed on the police uh, and have been over, increasingly so over the last few years. We recognise that they are on the front line in tackling those who carry knives, and that includes the National Weeks of Action under Operation Scepter that the Right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of St Albans, mentioned. And in the last week of action in March, we saw over 1,300 arrests and almost 11,000 knives taken off the streets. It's vitally that the police, uh, vital that the police have both the powers and the resources that they need to, t to tackle serious violence. On resources, we've heard today about the importance of providing police forces and police and crime commissioners with the funding they need to recruit more officers to keep our communities safe. The Government has increased funding for the police by a billion pounds this year, as the noble Lord, Lord Hogan Howe said, including council tax and the new £100, uh, £100 million serious violence fund that the noble lady, Baroness Hamley, talked about. I'll go on later to say more about the uh, fund, but it's worth noting that the overall settlement for the police this year is the biggest increase in police funding since 2010. Um, and to, answer, uh, to partially answer, because I'm, not, I'm sure it's not the, the whole answer, um, why the amount going in does not seem to correspond to very many police officers. Of course, there is always a lag effect when money comes in and police are uh, recruited, but I will try in writing and answer that, that question more fully because it is a very valid point. Um, so now turning to the Serious Violence uh, Fund, it was announced uh, in the spring statement on the 13th of March to help the police's immediate response in the force areas most affected by serious violence and to invest in the development of violence reduction units. We've announced 63.4 million of the fund to the 18 forces that are most affected by serious violence to pay for surge operational activity such as increased patrols and weapon sweeps. We've also allocated 1.6 million to help improve the quality of data on serious violence, particularly knife crime, to support police planning and operations that, 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 that the noble Lord, uh, Lord Hogan Howe was referring to. And just last week, the Home Secretary announced plans to allocate the remaining £35 million of the fund to support the establishment and development of violence reduction units in the 18 force areas, a true public health approach based, I think, on the Glasgow model. So thanks again to our Scottish friends. Violence reduction units will bring together representatives from the police, local government, health and education, community leaders and other key partners to develop a joint approach to tackling serious violence in local areas. And we're, supposed, we're supporting the police in their use of stop and search. The Government is clear that stop and search is an important police power and we encourage its fair, appropriate and proportionate use in helping to tackle serious violence. And I, I um, <clears throat> note and support the point uh, made uh, by the Noble Lord uh, Hogan Howe about how we can use better intelligence and technology as well to support that. Noble Lords may be aware that to go further in supporting the police, the Home Secretary announced on the 31st of March changes to Section 60 stop and search powers to make it simpler for officers in seven force areas to use these powers in anticipation of serious violence. The College of Policing is supporting forces with guidance on community engagement to address the issues of fair and appropriate use. And I, and I recall the Noble Lord uh, Hogan Howe talking um, a few months ago on the importance of engagement with local communities, and of the other Noble Lords have spoken about it this afternoon. It's a clear example of the government stepping up and the police tell us that they need further support. The Noble Lord, uh, Lord uh, Paddock and my Noble friend Lord Cormac talked about county lines and we are 
working with the police to tackle <coughs> county lines, which we know is drawing vulnerable young people into carrying knives and serious violence. And it's a highly violent form of child exploitation. As part of the serious violence strategy, we've provided £3.6 million for the establishment of the new National County Lines Coordination Centre to enhance the intelligence picture and support <coughs> cross-border efforts to tackle county lines. The centre launched in September of last year and it's overseen and carried out <coughs> excuse me, three separate weeks of operational intensification, leading to over 1,600 arrests, over two. 1,100 individuals safeguarded and the significant seizure of weapons and drugs. Now, my Lords, um, talking about <coughs> the public health approach, we know that there's no single solution to serious violence and that no single agency can deliver a sustainable solution on its own. It is only by working together to tackle the root causes <coughs> and prevent young people becoming involved that we will see lasting change. That was the underlying theme of the Serious Youth Violence Summit hosted by the Prime Minister at the beginning of April. A clear aim of the summit was to help forge a commitment to a multi-agency public health approach to tackling serious violence. One of the immediate outcomes of the summit was the establishment of a new ministerial task force chaired by the Prime Minister to drive action across government departments supported by a new <coughs> dedicated team in the Cabinet Office. The sub summit co coincided with the launch of the government's public consultation on a new statutory duty to underpin a multi-agency public health approach. The purpose of the proposed statutory duty is to make tackling serious violence a top priority for all key partners by ensuring that age agencies are working together to prevent young people being caught up in a life of crime and violence. The proposals set out in the consultation were not about giving new responsibilities to individual teachers, nurses or other frontline professionals. Rather, they were about a new duty that would require public bodies such as schools, hospitals, councils, youth offending services and police forces to work better together to share information and jointly plan and target their interventions to prevent and stop violence altogether. And as I said, um, the consultation uh, closed at the end of May and we intend to publish the government's response shortly. Moving on, my Lords, um, to the Offensive Weapons Act. Uh, we've legislated um, through that, that Act to close the net around violent criminals by giving the police more ta powers to tackle knives, acids and firearms. And it will, in particular, make it illegal to possess dangerous we weapons in private, including knuckle dusters and zombie knives. Um, and it will also bring in the new knife crime pre prevention orders. And, and I note that the noble Lord, Lord Paddock, um, is still very sceptical about these orders uh, and he's made his, his views clear before. Uh, but the police have told us they need the new orders to help divert at-risk young people away from knife crime, not to criminalise them, my Lords. I must emphasise that um, to address the noble lady, Lady Meachers and others' uh, point. We want orders that be preventative, not punitive. They're not an alternative to prosecuting those who are already acting violently, where existing criminal offences are more likely to be the appropriate uh, course. Uh, but the important point is the orders will enable the courts to place restrictions on the holder, such as curfews or geographical restrictions, and also positive requirements, such as engaging in relevant uh, interventions. Uh, my Lords, um, a number of noble lords have talked, and I'm aware well, time is running out, have talked about school uh, exclusions. Noble Lord, Lord Paddock, Bishop of St Albans, and Noble Lord, Lord Scriven, uh, Lord Story, Lord Addington, and, um, and Noble Lord, Lord Rosser, linking them to uh, knife crime. My Lords, um, we welcome Ed Timpson's wide ranging uh, review of school exclusions, which adds considerably to our understanding of current practice. And, and, and the Noble Lord, uh, Lord Rosser, outlined the very patchy picture 
of, um, uh, of school exclusions. The review makes 30 recommendations to support children at risk of exclusion uh, to remain in mainstream education to ensure that permanent exclusion is only used as a last resort and to reduce disparities in exclusion rates between different groups. We welcome those changes, uh, which will ensure that schools will make, remain accountable for the outcomes of the pupils that they exclude and which will place a register um, uh, I've suddenly lost that, that light flashing has completely made me uh, yes yeah, so I will shut up in, in, in very shortly but um, uh, no, the Bishop uh, right Reverend Prelate, the Bishop of Al St Albans made the point about employment he also talked about the churches keeping their doors open and I commend them for that because people do feel that churches are a very safe place. And the no my noble friend, Lord Cormac, talked very importantly about the importance of citizenship. And of course, I don't know if he's caught, come across the National Citizenship Service, but it is a fantastic thing introduced under the previous government. Um, I, finally, I'll just mention um, the importance of mental health uh, that the noble Lord, uh, Lord Paddock, um, uh, mentioned and of course Red Thread have been instrumental in the work that they do in hospitals and it includes uh, mental health work and um, the noble old Lord Delacchia talked about um, can we just have community sentences rather than um, short sentences well of course you can't have a community sentence if a if the option of custodial sentence is not available but as my, uh, the noble lord 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 hogan Howe said custodial sentences have their place in some instances my lord i have run out of time thank all noble lords who've taken part in this debate my lords i'm extremely grateful uh, to all noble lords for their valuable contributions there clearly is no simple solution to knife crime but that's no excuse for not pursuing everything that we know that does make a difference. Many solutions are long-term, but that's no excuse for not taking action now. And despite what the noble Baroness has said, current government action is not enough, it's not coordinated, and it is not properly long-term funded. I said that the plan that I proposed uh, in my opening remarks wasn't a Lib Dem plan, but maybe I can uh, uh, put a Lib Dem spin on this, and I look to the, the cross-bench contributions uh, to this debate for inspiration. The noble Baroness, Baroness Meacher, talked about legalising and regulating cannabis, and the noble Lord, Lord Hogan Howe, in his documentary for Channel 4, highlighted the vast sums of money raised uh, through taxation in American states as a result of cannabis being legalised. Maybe that's how we could fund some of this. My Lords, the Government's approach to knife crime needs to be looked at again, czar or no czar. I hope the Government will do exactly that. Yeah. The question is that this motion be agreed to. As many as are of that opinion will say contend. Okay. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. Baroness Bowles of Berkhamsted. My Lords. Global Restructuring Group, GRG, is a unit within RBS into which struggling companies were pushed with little option when instant repayment demands were threatened. Newspapers have been filled over the last few years with findings about their unfair treatment of SMEs. 92% unfairly treated and material damage to 25% are among the many baleful 